Why do we have a fuller house than usual, I wonder? <laughs> My guest tonight, <clears throat> uh, here's something that was once said of him. John Barber, the London critic, said, a young Welsh boy jumped on the back of this play as if it were a fiery charger and rode it to triumph. They don't write like that anymore. Uh, the play was Shakespeare's King Henry IV, part one. And uh, Barber went on to say that this man made Prince Hal noble without arrogance, graceful without effeminacy, handsome without dullness. I, uh, I don't think I could have described him better myself. Uh, he's also known for his bedrock honesty, his very Welchness, his magnetic personality, his blazing talent. On a, the rare occasion, if he misses a performance, it is headline news around the world. Uh, you, you know who it must be, don't you? Has anyone guessed yet? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome then one of the magnificent figures in the English-speaking theater, Mr. Richard Burton. Thank you very much for your, for your uh, encouragement. And that's the first time I've ever heard that notice. Uh, I know John Barber, yes, but I never read my own notices. That sounded rather good. I should have read it. <laughs> well, actually, I made it up. <laughs> oh, I <see. laughs> no, I, I guess uh, whoever he is, only he could write that well. Um, you know, I, I was checking you over to see if you were wearing any red. Uh, a red, mm -hmm. R-E-A-D, uh, that, that there's a superstition involving red. Is yes. it too private to reveal? Uh, no, not at all. I believe that... Uh, uh, oh, no. When I was... Uh, <laughs> oh. Of course, it was red on the tie. There, there, well, there's a little on the tie, but this is much more dramatic, I must say. <laughs> Also, I got red underpants on, but I'm sure you wouldn't well, have seen them. <laughs> How many would like... Well, never mind. Can't let the audience run the show for us. <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't think I can go on now. I've never had this happen. I can't take my eyes off. Those are very lovely. Uh, very elegant. Celsius. Also, I got very, very beautiful feet. Uh, yes? And very dainty ankles, if you know this. <laughs> Never had any complaints. Uh, never, never any complaints, yes. And they're Paisley socks for those who want to go out and get some just like them. Uh, I, I, I don't know why that reminds me, but I had a dream about this show, or these shows, that is, it was a collector's item, I think. It's, um, I, do you want to hear it? It's, uh, yeah. Maybe, you're, are you good at analyzing things like this? Uh, you came on in my dream, sat down, did not remove your shoes, and Without saying a word, you erected a card table here, and then another, and then another. As in that act in the circus when a clown gets on a stack of tables and sways. <clears throat> you insisted that I get atop this pile of card tables and do the show from there. <laughs> yes, uh, how to analyze that? I would, I would uh, think uh, very quickly that uh, quite clearly you'd be, it represented in your mind my career. Uh, hmm. a, a delicate balance. <laughs> there's no, no knowing when the whole cardboard structure would collapse. And you were oh. hoping that it would not. Why, why would it be your career, not mine? I, I, I've been uh, atop a few card tables. But... Well, I think that you, your reputation as, a, as a, an entertainer, as, a, as an interviewer, whatever it is, is steadier than mine as an actor. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, it's very good of you to put Thank you. yourself into the precarious position there. Well, if I feel the table slipping at all, I'll certainly be <laughs> glad to let you know. Uh, people around the country are going to get to, in more than New York, are going to get to see you uh, in, in, uh, in Camelot. And... Um, I think everybody must know that you did it before. So, in a lot of ways, you would think it must have been easier this time. And you can think of obvious ways in which it would be. But is there any way in which going back to it was, was tough or harder than you expected? 
Uh, yes, it's a little harder, I think, the second time round, uh, despite the fact that one's technique, uh, etc., uh, there's a much more massive body of technique behind the performance than there was 20 years ago. But one of the most difficult things about the present production is that in the early part of the show, I have to I have to make the audience believe that I'm vulnerable and that I'm not arrogant. Uh, and and that is uh, very difficult because I've played so many kings and princes, I've, I've assumed a kind of uh, almost regal arrogance every time I go on, on the stage. And uh, that is the most difficult part of the show for me. The first uh, section of, of the show, which lasts about perhaps uh, 28 minutes, and it takes me, for a time, I get very little response from the audience. Uh, they don't laugh uh, at the laugh lines, and then gradually they accept me uh, and forget who I am, I hope. And uh, then it's, it, it turns into a perfectly normal audience. Is there any particular uh, technique that you use for getting that sense of vulnerability? That, you know, it... Well, I stutter a little. Um, I don't know, well, you've seen the show and you've seen yeah. what I do. I'm not quite sure how I do it, or if, if indeed I do do it. Yeah. Did, you, did you think I did it? Yes, I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly. I'd be a fool to say no, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, no, you could say no, Richard, your natural arrogance came bursting through this way. <laughs> despite your Orlando costume. <laughs> Um, now that's the most difficult thing, I think, to, to do. Yeah. And if all else fails, you can always kick off your shoes and... Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Feel sorry for your socks or whatever. No, actually, I, I, I was... Uh, <clears throat> as I said to your production manager, I said mm. I, I, I very rarely watch talk shows, but when I do, I'm very conscious of, of people's shoes because they always cross their legs like this. Oh, let's try that's that. right. It seems to be a rule. Then. And, and the, the, the shoes are always in, 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 uh, in front of the, of the people. And I become so fascinated by the shoes. <laughs> and I forget to look at the faces, so I thought I'd try with my socks. That's right. It's but maybe they're, they're attracting more attention now, do you think, than... I don't know. I, 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 I like the idea that talk I shows are... I do that. Are, have been... <laughs> Makes a difference. I thought of some... I just thought of someone tuning in five minutes from now and wondering, saying, he really is on the skids. The guy has no... <laughs> Maybe you should explain every so often why. Tough all over. It's... Every five minutes, remind me to... Uh, yeah. Point. You're Reason right, why. you do feel like you have to cross your legs on a talk show, and it does... They have become more shoe business than show business. <laughs> well, very good. if I could get away with that... Uh, I remember that. Would you I'm believe we didn't plan any of this stuff backstage? <laughs> uh, are all Welshmen able to sing like a lark? It seems to be a, a national trait, and... Uh, um, no, they don't all sing like singing. larks, but uh, I know uh, there was a famous Welshman, for instance, who was famous for his music, actually, a man called Ivan Novello, oh, yeah. uh, whose uh, full name is Ivan Novello Davis, and he was a Welshman. He couldn't sing a note, but he wrote... Uh, those musicals that went on forever and ever, you know. Was, uh, I've forgotten what they were called now, but the dancing years, and and I think he wrote Keep the Home Fires Burning and stuff like that, but he couldn't sing a note. And I remember his telling me once that he did a tour of hospitals during the war, and a piano was, and he played his famous numbers. And in one ward, they asked him to sing. And he said, I can't sing, and they refused to believe him. And there was a lady who accompanied him on the tour. She was Welsh, too. And he said, Daphne, you sing. And she said, I can't sing either. So they tried to sing. And I didn't believe him. And I said, well, sing for me now. And he said, well, what do you want me to sing? And I said, well, sing uh, The Minstrel Boy to the War Hath Gone or something. And he sang. And it really was the most extraordinary cacophony, I believe the word is. <laughs> And it really wasn't the minstrel boy too. The war has gone. I mean, was, no, he couldn't do it at all, and I don't understand that. Oh, he ended up in the musical world. It's true. Very I mean, strange. Yes. Yeah. So he could pick out a tune, but he was tone deaf. I, th I, I thought the green valleys of Wales always rang with the natural voices of the. Oh yes, for the most part, I think we 
we, we sing rather better than, than most people. I don't know whether it's the, the, the coal dust in the air or, or, the, <laughs> um, the, or the eternal rain. Yeah. Uh, but certainly most, most Welsh people sing mellifluously. Yeah. How do you say what looks like Pontrhydrifen? Uh, Pontrhydrifen. 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 Means the bridge. Uh, we have a lot of Latin in our language. Yeah. Means the bridge across the vale or the valley. Yeah. And there is a bridge that crosses the, my village from mountain to mountain. And that's the village you were born in? Yes. Yeah. I, I don't know why. I, I had an image of your childhood as being upper class somehow <laughs> and uh, been to Oxford and uh, undoubtedly was to the manor born, if that's the right use of that. And um, it's, it was anything but that. Uh, I wonder how many other people are under the same mistaken no, I had uh, a very happy childhood. Was, uh, we were pretty poor. Yeah. It was during the Depression. My father was a miner. And um, all my brothers except one, my younger brother, were miners. And they all got out of the mines except the very oldest one uh, who loved the mines so much that I couldn't bribe him out. I couldn't get him. There was no way I could get him out. And he stayed in until the bitter end. Uh, so that he died. He died last year. Uh, no, he died this year, actually, about uh, five or six months ago. And you can imagine how tough the, the, the constitution of the family is, that with his lungs full of dust, uh, he lived until he was 79. And he was very uh, angry because he didn't make 80. Oh. But to have lived that long and to have worked, he went down the, the, the mines when he was 13 years old, and he came up when he was 65. And he died of the, the lung of, ailment from Yes, the, pneumoconiosis. Yeah. Well, you weren't being sarcastic when you said he loved the mines. Yeah, no, really, he, he really I didn't know them. anyone loved to... Oh, yes. Like, oh, yes. My, kind of my, my father, who was apparently a great miner, the, in the days before mechanization and so on, uh, when you got the great seam, there's a, there's a great seam, a famous seam, a, a world-famous one, which I believe is called the Great Atlantic Fault. And it starts in uh, northern Spain, in the Basque country. And it goes under the Bay of Biscay. And it comes up in South Wales. And it goes under the Atlantic and comes up in Pennsylvania. So that if you took a Basque miner or a Welsh miner or a Pennsylvania miner, and if you could blindfold them and transport them, and they know the, the coal face the minute they saw it. It's, it. I believe it's four feet, six inches. And my father used to talk about it as some men will talk about women talk about the beauty of this cold face. And my brothers would tell me stories about my father, um, who would look at the seam. My father's a very short man, an ideal height for a man. He was about five feet three or four. Very, very powerful, of course. And he would look at the, uh, at the seam of coal. And he would, as to uh, almost surgically make a mark on it and then ask his boy, every miner has a boy who works for him, and he would say, give me the number two mandrel, that's a half-headed pick. <clears throat> and then, having stared at this gorgeous display of black, shining ribbon of coal, he would then hit it with one enormous blow. And if he hit it right, something like 20 tons of coal would fall out from the coal face. Really? So that it was thrilling, it was exciting. And indeed, that's why I think when you perhaps think of me as being born uh, with a silver spoon and so on, uh, miners uh, believe themselves, or believed themselves anyway, to be the, uh, the uh, aristocrats of the working class. They felt superior to all other kinds of manual laborers. They were skilled workers. That cold face was a, was a magical creature. Has that all been replaced now by mechanized stuff? Yes, you drill stuff things now and you lost some cut out lumps of years. So your father would probably be against that. If, uh, yeah, well, he wouldn't say that. He'd say they're not miners at all now. They're just... Uh, machines do the work. Machines do yeah. the work, yes. Yeah. Did, did you have a fear of, of the mines? Um, what I'm trying to say is, did, did you see yourself as... Uh, that that was something to escape, to get out into another world? No, not at all, no. Uh, the opposite, as a matter of fact. 